Okay, so hi everyone. Um, so first, uh, this paper I, we work on with, with Pierre-Michel, which is here, but for sake of uh, the presentation sake, I'm going to do the presentation, but he's here also to answer all the questions that you might have, and I, for which I don't have the answer. So the, the paper is called uh, Bypassing the, the Box Office, uh, Performance, Risk, and Career Inequalities Among Women and Men Film Directors in France. So already having a title like this uh, can be quite provocative because the, the French is always very proud of having uh, this, this idea of cultural exception where movies are done not only for profit's sake but for, for uh, aesthetic reasons or for authorship reasons. And so uh, the re I don't know if you saw the recent debate about the, the Palme d'Or. I mean, there's the, um, among the last three Palme d'Or uh, at the Cannes Film Festival were two French uh, women directors. And uh, so, so she went on, on Justine Trier went on on, uh, on this idea that uh, the French uh, movie making uh, needs to be protected from this idea of being connected to any any sort of metric and so on. So, just we we, we dive into this sort of uh, of questions whether or not uh, directors are are assigned to some sort of box office metric. Um, so. Uh, so we're interested broadly in this, in this project about uh, talent, risk, and inequalities in the film industry. And uh, we specifically look at uh, contract data. This is sociologically what we're most interested in, the idea that if you look at, uh, at the filmmakers' contract, in this, but, but contracts in general, at the, at the sociological level, this is a moment when you can understand how power dynamics are, are made and created. Uh, so the, the large research questions that we try to tackle is how do filmmakers navigate the pressure to perform, survive, and negotiate career returns in this industry? So a few things that uh, make this industry uh, very specific and very interesting. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a very, very, very risky industry, especially in France. So uh, directors that we have in our, in our data set, they, they, they've been on average active 10 years before they can make a feature film, which is the holy grail of filmmaking. Not short movies, but a long feature, especially a fiction movie. This is something that you work a lot uh, to, to achieve. And uh, usually it takes about five years to put together between pre-financing, production, post-production, and so on. So you, there's not so, so, much, so many films you can do in your career, and it's a... It's a very large endeavor. And then on top of that, you have a very, very low chance of surviving. And so I'll show you some graphs later on. Um, and so in case you have a box office bust, especially on your first movie, it's very likely that you'll uh, get out of the industry. And so reputation is the name of the game. This is specifically uh, true in France, where directors are seen or as big authors and not necessarily just technicians, as they are sometimes in Hollywood. I mean, Hollywood has some names, but it's, uh, they're, they're less, you put less emphasis on this than in France. So uh, on a broader level, we're interested here in looking at what we call performance reward bias. It's the idea that uh, certain groups of director uh, will be able to earn better returns depending on their performance track record. So if you, if you make a good or a bad movie, how much can you uh, lean on this to improve your capacity to survive and then negotiate better income in the future and so on. And so uh, to give you the sort of uh, the paradox of, of this paper is that uh, a lot of uh, this literature has shown that there's, for instance, a, um, a performance reward bias that is detrimental to women, which means at equal productivity, productivity level or performance achievements, then women are less able to capitalize on these, on these achievements to achieve on the, to, to gain career, uh, better career outcomes, such as income or, or uh, promotion and so on. And we find the reverse. And so kind of the, 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 the key here is how do we explain th this reversal? Um, so along with video game production and TV shows, feature films are some of the most uh, capital intensive uh, projects that you can find within the creative <laughs> industries. Um, and uh, in France nowadays, there is a Relatively, relatively stable num number of projects, around 200 feature films that are produced every year, which is a lot for a country like France. Uh, it's been growing uh, stably, but it's, it's around 200. And there's an increasing pool of candidates uh, for a variety of reasons due to democratization, uh, attractiveness of, uh, for, from foreign capital and uh, film school attendance and so on and so forth. Uh, today, there's still 25% of women uh, among directors, and it's been a slow growth. So 30 years ago, it was 20%, now it's 25 It's been a little better, and we have some, some superstars that tend to show for it, especially those who win the Palme d'Or, but it's, it's still a so, slow growth overall. Um, and so what is specific about France is that most of the movies are pre-financed. The idea is that you, the, the, the producer doesn't take really any risk in terms of uh, financial viab viability. Uh, compared to the U.S., for instance, um, 
I mean, it's more complex than that, but simplifying, uh, you have different ways to get money from either public channels or private channels, especially TV channels. It's not the same channel, but like actual TV channels and uh, distributors. And so they give money beforehand if you're able to uh, convince them that your movie is going to be a great movie, it's going to make some money and so on. And so it all rests on the shoulder of the director to actually convince these, uh, these stakeholders to put their money put their, their chips uh, on, your, on your side of the table. Uh, is that clear? You, anyone can stop me if you have uh, questions. And so we, we try to understand how do prior experiences and, and performances drive survival changes in the industry. L'avance recette existe toujours. That's the... Yeah. So this, this idea that you get, if you've done some movies in the past, there's different ways to get the avance sur recette, then you automatically will get some, some money. It's a content, you submit a screenplay, and if you make it to avance sur recette, it's easier to get a co-producer. Yeah, but there are certain companies who have made movies in the past who can guess automatically l'avance automatique. And so we come back to this in the data, actually, because that actually plays a role. So a few uh, quick uh, elements. So this is the number of directed feature films uh, by the number of directors. So you have all directors in France uh, that have been, they, been active since uh, 1994. So that's uh, almost, it's around 2,200 <coughs> film directors. For, so you see a sharp drop after the first movie. And then there's very, very few uh, directors who actually survive past the, the fourth or fifth movie. So short careers, uh, high risk. And then the line here that you see is the, the one really key variable here is the, the fixed payment is the idea that you get uh, on your next film, you're going to get a, an advance depending on the, the result of your prior film. And so you can see that uh, these, these, this advance kind of goes up for the first movies. And then it becomes quite erratic because there's not so much data by the, on the right side of the graph. But, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's quite... Uh, Parition and, and I mean, there's the sort of power law curve. And it's the same for movie budgets. So you can see that, of course, it's much lower than in Hollywood. Most movies in France are, have budgets under five million. Uh, and this is specifically true for women who, who tend to be channeled towards uh, low budget movies, especially documentaries, uh, not only, but uh, at genre, you can control by genre and you can show that even within a genre, you have these persisting inequalities. Uh, and so uh, what data do we use here? So. Uh, we have three main uh, data sets that we try to combine. Um, so the first two ones are in the, this first section. So first, we've gathered information on all uh, close to 5,000 feature films that have been distributed in France between 96 and 2019. So it, these are movies that were actually made, not, not movie projects and so on. These are movies that people were actually able to see within the theaters. And so this uh, comes down to almost 2,000 directors because there's a lot of directors who do several movies. Hopefully, that's our... That's one of our key uh, variables. And then among these, uh, these, this, uh, the, um, these directors, we've uh, extracted a sample of uh, almost 600, uh, close to 600 directors. And for those, we uh, hand-coded all of their copyright contract, which is basically uh, the first document that a producer signs with the filmmaker. And so they decide on if the movie is going to be made, how much money uh, will the producer give to the, to the director. Um, for, for this movie and so on. And so these are very complex and very heterogeneous contracts. They can range from eight pages to 75 pages and they really require a lot of, a, of a hand, like human work. And uh, so we've extracted 200 uh, contracts for uh, three years, 2006, 2014, 2018. And for, all the, for these years, we have a complete sample. Means, meaning we have all the contracts that's been, that have been signed in France for three years. So even though it, we can not do like panel stuff because we cannot follow uh, directors throughout the entire careers, we have this sort of like uh, uh, complete samples for different years, which allows us to, to, to understand an evolution uh, within this. Uh, so then we've uh, matched this uh, contract data with information on uh, the past careers uh, of directors in France, and we thank the SSED. Uh, who came here to listen to our presentation, but they allowed us to get some uh, really, really uh, exhaustive information about what those directors did before they, they uh, directed their first movie. Uh, so that allows us to control for some of the heterogeneity in, in entering the career. 
And then finally, we, we gathered a bunch of information from, from online sources. Uh, you talk about IMDB. There's an equivalent in France called UniFrance. Uh, it's not a website only. It's a professional association, but they have a lot of very... Com IMDB doesn't work for French cinema. That's part of the exception. You don't have very reliable information, so you have to go to UniFrance. And so, for instance, you can know if... Uh, uh, if people have production companies for which talent agencies they were, they, they, by which talent agencies they are represented, I'll come back to these, uh, to these uh, mechanisms later. later. So we're basically uh, interested in, in three things, um, how you enter the industry, how you survive in the industry, and how you actually make money from this, uh, within this industry. Uh, so we don't have a lot of data on, on entering. This has been covered also by some qualitative work. Uh, but basically, we, we've, we've been able to extract some information on 353 uh, first-time directors for which we have a complete career path before they directed their first movies. And so running that through, uh, through various uh, clustering uh, methods, we, kind of, uh, we can show that uh, there's basically two clusters. Uh, it's very strong, like depending whatever the algorithm always comes up with the, the two same clusters. So there's basically a main bulk cluster where you have uh, people who um, have done... No, what's the pointer? Yeah, so a lot of people have gone through short films. Uh, so this is the, the idea of the anti-chamber. You're supposed to direct short films and then have festival success, and then maybe later on you'll be able to direct your first movie. Um, most women are in this category, and uh, they have a, a scarcer access to, uh, to uh, pre-financing. And then you have a more privileged cluster. Uh, it's a minority group but basically uh, cons consisting of uh, um, uh, script writers, so people who were not directors before, but already wrote scripts for feature films. So there's this idea of multi-activity, which is really central to this industry. Most men are in, uh, min most of, uh, individuals in this category are men, and they have access to secure investment, to give you an idea. Uh, this is the difference in main budgets between clusters. So uh, it's close to, it's more than three times uh, higher for the second cluster, so the more privileged cluster. And yeah, so... The channel, and if you, you, you start being, uh, you know, uh, trainee, assistant, and all that, that, that channel is no. also important? No, no, no it, it doesn't work really like that in France. If you're, there's some qualitative work that shows you if you're an assistant director, you will be stuck as an assistant director your whole life. So that uh, number also is changed. Uh, yeah, I mean, from, from what we know today, it's, uh, it's very rigid. Uh, there's, there are some examples, but it's specifically for women, there's been this idea that... Yeah, that's that, that was at the time, but like, for instance, there's, there's a lot of women who are assistant directors, and they, never and they never become directors. Some exceptions exist, like Claire Denis and some others, but it's, yeah. it's, it's fairly rare. Uh, so this is only... Um, uh, cinema type work, like author work, so of course it captures only part of the heterogeneity. Uh, to become a director, you can have, I mean, there's, there's many possibilities for you to enter this industry. This, this data only captures your, your past career work, but we've gathered some other stuff. Um, for instance, one really important thing is um, film school. Uh, so women um, attend film school basically twice as more as men. So this is really consistent with a lot of uh, other industries, like the fashion industry, the art industry, and so on, where film schools tend to drive democratization. So the, we, we have only, the, uh, this is data from La Femis, which is the main uh, film school in France. There's, there's others, but this is the main one, the most uh, elitist one, let's say. And, um, and then there's a, an, another important uh, point, is that uh, a lot of men, especially within this privileged cluster, are former producers. So they were already in the industry, but they were not authors they were working as producers. Uh, and so um, you can see, for instance, that if you calculate the number of directors who are also producers at the time that they direct their first movie, the numbers tend to be a lot higher for women, but there is, uh, for men, sorry, but there's a very strong evolution. So you can see that the, the, wom the women producers are, are slowly catching up. So it's almost uh, getting to similar uh, levels for 2018. And on the contrary, and this is something uh, uh, that maybe some of you have not noticed who are interested in, French, in the French movie industry, but a lot of uh, French women directors have been former actresses. Uh, so you really have a polarization between men who are, who are producers before and women who are, who are actresses. So among the 20 most successful women directors, two-thirds uh, were former actresses, whereas it's only 20% 20, 20 for men. So this is a very, very strong uh, thing. So moving on to surviving. Um, 
So what is interesting in the movie industry is that you have one really powerful metric, which is the box office success. And this is compared to other industries, like the fashion industry, what we heard before, it's, it's easy to track the performance of someone. So then you can have also other aspects like critical reviews, word of mouth, and so on. But what is important with the unique, I mean, quite unique with the box office is that it incorporates a lot of the critical aspects as well. For instance, um, if you have festival success, your movie comes out after the festival has been issued. And so the, the box office uh, numbers kind of integrate already this, this critical aspect of it. So for instance, the Palme d'Or will come out, everybody knows that it has a, the Palme d'Or sign on it. So of course, the, 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 everybody expects the, the theatrical success of this movie to be a lot higher because of this Palme d'Or. Uh, so we basically, in this uh, sur survival analysis, we use uh, event history analysis. I guess we call that uh, uh, survival models in economics, but it's mostly the same. And we, we uh, try to understand uh, what drives survival chances from one movie to the other. So uh, if a person has made one movie, how can we explain the movie? Uh, the, the, how can we predict the probability of making a second movie, a third movie, a fourth movie, and so on? So the, this is what we call in the literature the accumulative productivity values, which means we, we, we add up all the box office successes of the, 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 the past films for one director. Uh, and so we have to um, use a specific model, I'll, I'll just explain later on, but you, as you can see, uh, the, this is the percentages of surviving director between the, 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 first, the second and third movie, the, the third and fourth movie, and the fourth and fifth movie. And uh, the, the rates are actually quite similar, and they, the, the rates for women are actually higher. Uh, but it doesn't mean that it's the same people that survive. And this is one of the key uh, elements. Um, and so women have to basically wait a lot longer to make a second movie, a third movie, and so on. This is the main source of inequality. So we use, it's a little bit, what is tricky is that the, the structure of the data is a little bit complex because you have, first you have delayed entry, which means that a lot of people don't enter the industry at the same time. And of course, you have heterogeneity because of this. And secondly, people make multiple movies. And so you can't assume that uh, making a third movie is independent of having already survived the first and second challenges and so on. So we have to use one specific type of model, which is often used in, uh, in modeling tumor resurgences in cancer research. The idea that, uh, of course, if you, had, if you have treatment after a cancer, uh, we don't know exactly what are your chances of surviving, but once you've had a first tumor, your chances of developing a second tumor are a lot higher and so on. So this is a little bit morbid, I'm very sorry, but this is, this is exactly the, the model that we use to, because I think it really fits the movie industry. Uh, the, m the more you survive, the better your chances are at surviving. And so, um, so we basically estimate a, a Cox regression model uh, using the specific framework, which is done through a, a stratification variable, which basically pulls subjects by failure order. Uh, the idea is that, the, of course, if you want to evaluate the effect of having directed one, your first movie on the fourth movie, you have to isolate, these are not separate effects, they have a specific order. You've made your second movie after you've made your first, you've made your third after you made your second, and so on. So right, this is a little bit technical, but basically what it shows you is that uh, the, um, the coefficient, so the, what we measure here is the impact of selling one additional ticket on the chances of uh, surviving in the industry. And so we measure it separately for women and men for surviving one's first movie, second movie, and, and, and uh, Sorry, uh, first movie, second movie, third movie. And so uh, the coefficients, and this is uh, the main result of this analysis, are a lot higher for women than for men. Which means basically you can say on the one hand, uh, women actually gain a lot more returns from having a successful movie, but you can also, and we understand it in the reverse way, is the idea that you, you have to make a very successful movie to kind of have better chances to survive in the industry, and this is less true for men much less, and the ratio actually increases as you, uh, uh, as you uh, go further in the career. So the ratio for the fourth movie is uh, close to 14. So the, all right, uh, for equivalent success levels, uh, the, the chances of surviving for, for uh, uh, low succeeding women are, are a lot uh, lower than for men. But yeah? if you make a big box office of, uh, you know, success, how many low success are you allowed for to not disappear? See, give a conditional on a high success, does it increase the number of moderate success that are tolerated? Uh, so this is, uh, yeah, we asked ourselves that question through, through, through this. We yeah. can't do it in a very, very 
elegant way because we don't have so many directors who actually survive past the third or fourth movie. This is why we do only uh, K equal four for the for the main one. Otherwise, after we're left with very very small samples. And so, but what is interesting is that in the in the industry you have a saying that says you're as good as your last picture. So the idea is that you don't have any sort of institutional memory. Once you make a bust, this is specifically true in Hollywood, you'll get kicked out of the industry. And what we find is that actually this is true for women, but not for men. Even though the, 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 the sample size is much lower for, for, for women, um, the effect of the second movie, for instance, of, uh, yeah, sorry, the effect of the first movie will still have an impact on the third movie, irrespective of whether the second movie were, was a bust or... A, Sorry? For, for women, for women. So there is, no, uh, there is no memory for men, but there is memory for women, which means basically if you've made a bust for women and you are able to survive, then you're still, the, the, the memory of that, of that bust will still follow you later on in your career. But for men, it seems like the clock is reset at every uh, time. Um, and so we control for a bunch of, uh, of uh, variables uh, like movie genre, the, 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 the structure of uh, uh, movie financing, and also the cohort uh, variables. So basically, being in fiction is, uh, increases your probability of surviving. This is, I mean, if you're a documentary filmmaker, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a bigger hustle than in fiction. And of course, uh, the, the, the younger the generations, the, high, the, the more difficult it gets. <laughs> So compared to a baseline of a cohort from 96 to 2000, uh, all the later cohorts have a, have a lower chance of, of surviving it, except for the, for the more advanced director, which makes sense. Yeah, do, do you have a way to take into account the relationship between the actors and the film directors? Because you know there are some film directors that have a, a very high chance of being No, this is something that uh, it becomes very hard to measure the, the star power of an actor. And also, um, the, uh, yeah, it's a, no, it's actually a good point, but we, there's a lot of literature on, on star power and so on. Uh, our guess is uh, that since we, it's the same, the, the box office actually will integrate already part of that, of that effect. Like if you have Depardieu in your movie, then people will go see the movie and then it will increase the theatrical yeah, measure. Yeah. And so, so we don't necessarily have that, but there's a way to, to understand it. I'll come back to this later on. Um, and the idea that uh, we try to capture industry uh, resources and so social capital in that sense, and that, that could also factor in. Uh, just quick correct the script. I mean, you might have said this, I missed it, but if you just looked at the first film, which is made, and looked at the box office for men versus women, is there a big difference under the observables exchange? But the problem is that we don't, since uh, we have only data for people who actually made it to their first movie, that's, that was the point of the, the, few, the few slides that we had before on, the, on what people had done before the first movie. For the, for the first movie? Yeah. I'm just asking about the first Yeah, yeah. So, so um, oh, you mean in, the, in this data set? Yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, past, okay. past thing or just heterogeneity? For the, for the first movie. Yeah. The first time you make a movie, who gets the bigger box office men or women? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We've made some uh, some uh, some charts on this. Actually, for the first movie, it's very similar. So uh, yeah, yeah, it's something that I I do not focus here so much. But this whole idea that maybe women make less profitable movies. Actually, it's not true. If you look at the charts, uh, it's fairly equivalent. Like the budgets are much lower for women, but once you uh, divide this by the box office success, the the the, the ratios are fairly similar. Uh, that's quite interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Hey, we need to rule out this thing, right? And the moment that the two curves actually diverges is, is for uh, later on in the career. Of course, if you... The most simple type of criterion type of discrimination is a bigger entry barrier for women than men. And what you described is, 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 I think, consistent with that. Ah, yeah, you're right. Women are more productive than making more outputs and further inputs. And that's consistent with simple kind of entry barrier. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point, actually. Yeah, I forgot, actually. I, I, at some point, I thought about including this thing, but there's... There's, we need to consistently rule out the idea that uh, women directors have a lower productivity than men. Well, I think that, that, that sounds like they're hard. Yeah, yeah. The more that. And con all things considered, yes. Um, so now, uh, what can we say about, uh, about 
the, the income returns, because that's also part of it. It's not only about surviving, it's also about making money. And so we study one specific um, dependent, uh, sorry, uh, uh, outcome variable, which is the guaranteed minimum, which is basically a fixed advance on the contingent payment. So this is a little bit technical, but basically, once you sign your first contract before, the script has even been written before you understand actors, before anything else, the producer and the director sit down and uh, they, they put down an amount of money, let's say like 50,000 euros, and they say, okay, well, I'll give you 50,000 right now. And if the movie, movie generates more than 50,000, then you'll start earning a variable income on top of the 50,000. So uh, in France, since not a lot of movies actually make uh, a lot of money, uh, the guaranteed min minimum is basically the main uh, wage or the main income that these, these directors will get. So basically it's a, it's a hard negotiation because they know that if you get 20,000, it's very unlikely that you'll get even like uh, 21,000. You'll basically get your, your minimum, guaranteed minimum and that's it. Uh, and so uh, we try to understand what drives uh, the differences between, um, between directors. So we had a very complicated slide on the, on the complex uh, multi-layered compensation of the of the, of the directors, so to just present you with the general idea, there's basically in France, if you're a director, you earn both uh, wages, that means as a, as a worker, but basically what we call socialized wages, so it's the system of intermittence. So basically it's like uh, if you were a technician on a movie, like an editor or uh, someone working with light or sound and so on. And on the other hand, you earn money as an author. So droit d'auteur or what, people call copyright law in, in the US, except if it's a little bit different. And so in this, uh, this is where you have variability because in the socialized wages, this is uh, uh, predetermined by uh, collective convention. So it's in the law how much you're, you're allowed to make. There's little variation, but it's very, very small. So uh, statistically speaking, it's more interesting to look at the droit d'auteur because that's where you have so much variability between directors. And so, of course, there's the non-contingent part that I talked about earlier, which is the fixed advance. And then, of course, this fixed advance can be, can be uh, complemented by uh, variable forms of income. So, of course, there's, uh, there is some money that you can make on uh, gross profits and then on net profits. And then, of course, there's some bonuses. For instance, if your movie reaches, I don't know, one million uh, ticket sales, then you'll earn another 50,000 more and so on. So we focus specifically on this because uh, this is where you see uh, uh, the most variability between, uh, between authors. So again, a uh, quick graph about the, the distribution of uh, the fixed advance. So it's very, very, it's a very, very uh, pronounced power law. Again, uh, also very detrimental to women. Uh, and then I think I'll skip this, uh, but it, there's a relationship between basically the, the advance payment and the, and the variable, uh, which basically depends on the risk. If you're, well, I think I don't have time, but I can comment on this in the, in the questions. There's connection in the contracts between the fixed and the variable, which makes sense. It's uh, some results that have been shown for finance and so on. Uh, and so we try to explain why the correlation between the box office measure that we have and uh, the guaranteed minimum, so the fixed advance, is much higher again for women. So the correlation is 0.64 for women, so it's very, very strong. Almost all of the uh, explainable variation for women in terms of income is explained by past box office successes, and for men it's much lower. So this raises the question of why and to what degree are men able to bypass the box office? Men, not only men, but like this is specifically true for men. And so uh, there's two types of uh, mechanisms that play here. Uh, agents, and I'll come back shortly after that to, to these mechanisms. So we actually find that uh, tale talent agencies are more uh, play a big role for men directors, but not so much for women directors. And then industry capital, which means here, uh, the fact that people were uh, or are still film producers on the side of being film directors. So this idea that you can switch from being an employee to a boss. Uh, and this is very specific to the French film industry. The idea that you can be uh, a director and a producer sometimes for the same movie. Like we actually have some contracts uh, where people are, they say, uh, I producer and it's one name and then uh, enroll this director and it's the same name and you have exactly the same signatures on top and on the bottom. It's some sort of legal haziness. The idea is that if you don't work for the same boss the entire year, if you can show that you've worked for other bosses, other producers, then this is sort of legit. But it creates some obvious conflicts of interest where 
we have some contracts, we, I, I will not cite names, although they are very famous, but uh, where you have really incre uh, incredibly high uh, uh, fixed advances and the people sign both ends of the contract. So of course you're going to sign a huge advance if it's yourself that you're signing for. And so uh, this plays, of course, a role, as we'll show later on. So here, uh, to, um, to measure this, we use uh, quantile regressions because uh, the data is so cute that it's actually interesting to see uh, for which segments of the distribution this relationship uh, plays a role or not. And so the main results is that here again, like in the survival rates, the connection between box office entries and uh, the fixed advance is uh, much higher for women. And uh, actually here you see a convergence uh, as you increase the decile. So it means that uh, this is basically this graph. Uh, so this plots basically the coefficients for men here and for women uh, of the outcome of the quantile regressions for different quantiles. Uh, so here from one to, for different deciles here from one to 10. And so basically you can see that the effect is much higher. It's very similar to begin with and then starting from the second decile, it becomes much higher for women, and then it soon reaches a sort of plateau. Uh, so, so this is the part where you have a sort of glass ceiling effect, like the, the returns that you earn for, for, for your box office performance doesn't get much higher, and then the rates converge for a higher percentile. So, so of course, that there, uh, we have a very high intervals for women because the sample is much smaller, but it's still quite interesting to see that basically at the moment that uh, you're really, really well entrenched in the industry, men and women kind of earn like similar rates. So going back to our, to our um, results, um, the, the, you have this convergence that you can see here and these are very, very, very strongly significant. Uh, and they're much higher for women. So you have, you have a, a reversal of the performance reward bias that I was talking about. The idea that here, women who su succeed actually make a lot more money than, than men. And so uh, we understand it the other way around, saying like if women do not succeed, then they, they will not be able to make in, uh, as much money. And so part of why, like the mechanisms, why, why that works, and we, we know this also from qualitative evidence, but this is, uh, we can capture it to some degree through, uh, through our, our data. Um, the idea that you have certain connections with the industry. So for lower deciles, for instance, what plays, seems to play a, a major role is the, the size of the producer firm. So we know actually the social capital of the firm, and we know that the bigger the firm, the more money you will, you will make as a, as a director. So what uh, practically that means that if you're a young director, rather than trying to prove that you have so much talent and so on, you should try to convince a big producer that, uh, that you can make a successful movie, which kind of makes sense, but it's an interesting thing to show. And this, effects, this effect disappears uh, past the, basically the third decile. So for people who make a little bit more money, having connection to a famous producer is, becomes not so important. Rather, at the other side of the, of the, of the distribution, we have a variable here that basically captures uh, the number of films that a director has produced. Apart from being a director, he produces movie and he earns returns from this. And this effect becomes really high for higher deciles, which means that as a director, as you become more successful in your career, one of the most interesting things you can do is start your own production firms. And then try to make a, and you, you will earn returns from this uh, as your personal income from, from directing through your producing activities. And there's very famous uh, examples like Luc Besson or Gaspar Noé or people like this who have made this. They, they've, once they were established, they started really successful production firms. And this does not work for women, uh, which is partly due to the fact that there's, there's not so many uh, women directors, but that we, we think that this is one of the key results, the idea that uh, there's so much cross-section between directing and producing that we should focus, of course, on, on uh, gender inequalities, but we should also focus on, for instance, that women, uh, that there's more and more women producers, rather than just equalizing the, the, the um, uh, the revenue, and uh, and the last, uh, sorry, the last, uh, yeah, I haven't, yeah, I, I haven't included the right slide, but it's this this uh, variable here, the agent, and so what is interesting is that the agent consistently plays a role for men and not for women, and this is this is quite um, paradoxical because I don't know if you watch the the, the show 10 percent or uh, in there. Call my agent. Yeah, you can see that. Uh, we, we see in the contracts that actually the 10%. Yeah. 
And the 10% thing is actually in the contracts. Like the contracts we have is consistently 10%. What is interesting is that most of these agents are actually women. And you, you see that in the show, but we also see that in the contracts. And so it becomes paradoxical to understand why an agent that is a woman is not able to endorse uh, uh, her clients, her women clients, as well as the, the men clients. And there's, there's qualitative evidence on this. And the, the intuition behind this is that, again, we go back to the, to our, I don't go back, but the, the, one of our first slides, I said that most of the women directors in France are former actresses. And actually, this plays a huge part because uh, if you are in front of the camera, the expectations are very different in terms of norms and expectations. You're expected to be pretty and you're expected to be passive and you're, you're told what you're supposed to do. Once you move behind the camera, uh, then you're supposed to embody the sort of artistic archetype thing where you're supposed to give order, being a manager and so on. And so there's a lingering effect of, um, of these uh, societal expectations. And so it becomes very hard and we have, we have very interesting quotes from qualitative work that says basically the women engine said we're, we're not able to defend uh, uh, our women clients as much because uh, we don't know what words to use. Because they, usually when they defend Luc Besson, they'll say, well, probably Luc Besson doesn't need an agent, but they, they'll say like, oh, he's very strong, he knows what he wants, he's made good movies in the past and so on. So the intuition behind this is that uh, the, there is a role played by uh, uh, per, what we call performance brokers, the people who help you turn uh, your performance results into income uh, later in your career. Uh, so just uh, one or two remarks. Uh, so we do observe a reversal of the performance reward bias, and the only case that is similar to ours is academics. There are some recent papers now that tend to show that basically the, the impact of one additional paper, for instance, on the probability to get tenure is much higher for women in academia than it is for men. So it's, it's kind of similar, similar idea. So we have a process of leaky pipeline, of course, but we also have this idea that uh, basically if the main thing in your field is surviving, this is where you're going to put all your chips. Uh, and then the payoffs will follow later on. If you survive, you'll obviously make more money because you'll make successful movies and so on. But the most important point is to hedge yourself against bust. And so this is why, uh, this is what uh, very successful directors are able to do, especially men. They're, they're, they're able to sort of bypass the strict box office uh, pressure and use other type of resources to, to edge themselves in case they, they, they make a bust. They're still able to, uh, to, to survive. And so uh, this leads us to say that basically industry resources can partially offset the, the pressure to succeed uh, for specific professional segments, uh, and especially for men. Have okay. you looked at the TV, TV just movies? Uh, uh, have you looked at the TV movies? Uh, that there's another parallel. Uh, does you, do you include? Do you know we have? So we include this in... So, uh, I know now there is a big trend in, on TV to push for women directors and... Uh, Sorry. Are you looking at uh, uh, so also we the fact that you may go, you may go from movie to TV mm -hmm. or back? Have you we've looked that, at that this. More series and more TV going on now. Uh, it's a, it's has a very good changed? point actually. Has it changed? Uh, so we have data on uh, on contract data. Yeah. So we know exactly if people have made like short movies for for TV for for cinema and so on. And so. Um, this seems to have, at least on our data, it has no impact on the survival chances. Mm -hmm. The only thing that it has, I think, if I remember correctly, um, no, sorry, but the, the problem is that this is always we play around with partial data, and in the survival model, we, we're not able to have so much information. Uh, this is very costly information to get, so the only sample for which we have this information is the, the contract data, and so I've included it in various forms. For instance, here, I've put the the only thing that seemed to have an effect was the, the, the fact that you've made uh, short films before. And, um, but I could include uh, other things such as TV, and we have feature films and short films, but in the several models that I've tried, it doesn't have any sort of effect, which is interesting. Maybe it's a recent trend, especially with platforms and Netflix emerging, that if you make money out of TV, you'll be able to transfer into cinema. But in France, it seems to me intuitively that there is still a very strong distinction between between yeah, audiovisual, so TV and movie, and movie people are seen as well. TV to, you can go from movie to TV. Number of people who go bust on the movies. They go, they go back to TV. They go to TV. And and some people back in the day would have uh, like very famous directors in France would made less of a difference. They they have very successful TV careers, yeah. but also make. Uh, 
make a very successful feature. It seems like now the divide between uh, author movies and like commercial TV movies is a little bit more pronounced. But I think one of the hypotheses of this whole platform change is that this sort of uh, goes down. Building on what you just discussed, so in, you know, if somebody doesn't get tenure in academia, usually at least in economics, that's not the end of the world. You, you end up doing uh, interesting things uh, somewhere else. Uh, uh, what about these people? So if, if I don't get to do my second feature film, what do I do? Uh, that's, that's a difficult question. Part of the, yeah, TV, you can, you can fall back on television. Um, yeah. Screenwriter, you can, you can be a teacher. That's, uh, there's been some, uh, Michel has done this, but I mean, there's, we know some things that, uh, especially in the arts, if you're not successful as an artist, you fall back as a professor. Especially there's a lot of like, uh, teachers in uh, film school who have done only one movie. And so they can take the students through the process of, of having to find finances and so on. But since they haven't had a really a successful career, uh, then they, they become teachers and out of this one single experience that can last up to 10 years, they still make a future career. And the last thing is probably movie critics. I don't have information of this, but I know in the industry a lot of people say like, oh, he's just a frustrated, failed director. He's not a, that's why he's hating on my movie and so on. I think you can afford to stalk them online to figure out exactly what they became, regardless of success. Like actually ah, yeah. looking at the after, kind of the post-bust career and whether they're different for women and men. So we have 2,000. Sorry. No, this is for the, for the, for the survival 2000, data. 2,000, still, that's still not big data. That's just medium data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you can do it. <laughs> yeah, the thing is we, we it's, for instance, I've coded, hand-coded men and women in the, uh, the way with respect to identity, and there's no, of course, no, uh, in, that, in the French cinema, there's no transgender uh, until today. So this is, can be done for one variable. For later successes, it's something that we should keep in mind. We haven't really thought about this, no? LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, but that's a good point. I know some examples of people who are now teaching in film school, uh, or they sit on juries. There, there's a lot of things that you can do after. Uh, but I think that might be uh, something to pursue in a, in a later work. Usually, in that trade, you have to manage a kind of portfolio of multiple professional roles, and then you can switch from one to the other, depending on the risk and the success in one role. And but that's very often the multiple job holding and uh, switching. Uh, you try to, to learn what you are able to do, etc. But need some different, of course, information and data to check that. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.